scheduled delivery for Lord Baskerville. Excuse me, Your Grace. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. What? 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 Oh. This arrived by special delivery. Uh, that's, that's all right, Barrymore. You haven't forgotten, my lord, that Dr. Mortimer will be arriving at seven o'clock tonight for dinner. Thank you, Barrymore. <laughs> Could I bring you another glass of wine? Uh, no, thank you, Barrymore. But I would like my heavy walking boots and my overcoat, if you please. You're surely not going out, Sir Charles. After such an excellent meal and such good wine, I should like a stroll down to the old orchard. I really wouldn't advise that, my friend. You know your heart. It is exceptionally cold tonight, Sir Charles. I'm sure Dr. Mortimer would prefer you not to take any risks. Yes, yes, Barrymore, I know all that. However, a few minutes in the fresh air could only do me good. I'll walk with you as far as the back lane, then I'll trot along home, Sir Charles. Thank you, James. That'll be very pleasant. <laughs> Well, this is where we part company. It's been a very pleasant evening. We must do it again. Very soon. And don't worry about me. I shall stop worrying once you're back inside your own front door. <laughs> Good night, Sir Charles. Nothing we can do for him. Call for some help to take the body back to the house. That can't have been a dog. any physical defect. We have heard sufficient evidence that Sir Charles had a long history of heart disease and that on this particular evening he had supped and whined to a sudden <coughs> fullness that required him to take a little constitutional walk in aid of his digestion. For that reason, I am quite ready to believe that he must have placed too great a strain on that most precious of his organs and find that... Your Worship! I have good reason to believe. Quiet! I would remind you, sir, that you yourself had imbibed a glass or two that sad evening, and that even if you did hear what sounded like a hound, there are no marks on the body to support your suggestion. I return to what I was saying. And I shall go to Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. I am. And you? Dr. James Mortimer from Coombe Tracy in Devon. Won't you come in? May I present Dr. Watson, a professional brother to you, a vital assistant to me. How do you do? I desperately need your help. In what respect? Your fame as a great unraveler of mysteries has spread even to the backwaters of Devon, Mr. Holmes. I have a problem that needs a man of your intellect to resolve. 
describe this problem? Three months ago, a very good friend of mine, Sir Charles Baskerville, was killed under very suspicious circumstances. I read the coroner's report in the newspaper. I thought he decided the causes were natural and that you... That I was seeing not just pink elephants, but also ghostly hounds the size of Shetland ponies. Did you see such an animal? I never claimed to see the hound, only its paw mark, and I was not drunk. Why are you so sure that the mark was made by a dog? Because of this. It describes the origin of the curse of the Baskervilles. It says here, Baskerville Hall, 1742. Apparently, Sir Hugo Baskerville became besotted by the comely daughter of one of his yeomen, and one drunken knight abducted her and locked her in a bedroom. He gathered together a dozen of his wicked companions to celebrate his success in taking this wench against her father's wishes. During that drunken revelry, the maid escaped through a window and fled into the night. When Sir Hugo discovered this, he called for his horse and hounds and took off to hunt her down. She had some hours start and was far away, so Sir Hugo whipped his horse furiously to speed him up. He soon left his comrades behind and sped like the wind across the Devon moors. A few shepherds sitting with their charges were amazed to see this man ride through the night with such haste. But even more amazing was that Sir Hugo obviously never realized that the hunter was also the hunted. Hard on his heels was, and here I read, such a hound of hell as God forbid should ever be at any man's heels. The chase continued. Eventually, the friends of Sir Hugo appeared and rode to the top of the hillock, from where they could see, by the light of the moon, right down into the deep valley. What they saw sickened and terrified them. The maiden lay dead, having dropped from exhaustion. Nearby was Sir Hugo's body. He'd been overtaken by the fearful hound, who was at that moment ripping mouthfuls of flesh from the dead man's neck with flashing fangs and eyes glowing through the night. The friends returned to Baskerville Hall to report this story and to have it written down as a warning to the sons of the Baskerville family to beware the hound that waits for them on dark night on the moor. Do you find it interesting? To a collector of fairy tales, yes. I'm sorry you think that. Do you believe it? I don't know what to believe, except that Sir Charles did not die a natural death. I want you to help me find the truth. I'm afraid I cannot accept such a commission. I have on hand the little affair of the Vatican cameos and am anxious to oblige His Holiness. Besides, what's to be gained from proving that Sir Charles was really killed by a mythical hound? It is of the utmost importance that this mystery be cleared up immediately. Oh, now, Mortimer, you can't mean that. In about two hours, Sir Charles' only heir arrives from Canada to claim his inheritance. I want to be sure that Sir Henry will live to enjoy it. Well, that's an interesting aspect of the mystery. Perhaps we'd better bring Sir Henry here tomorrow morning. At 10 o'clock. Come in. This is Sir Henry Baskerville. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Holmes. The funny thing is that if my friend hadn't suggested coming to you this morning, I might well have come of my own accord. You see, this came by mail to my hotel just now. Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel. Hmm. Who knew you were staying there? Not at all. I know no one in this country, and I didn't choose this hotel until I arrived in London yesterday. Someone is taking a very deep interest in your movements. If you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor. Well, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you can tell me what in tarnation all this means. What do you make of it, Dr. Mortimer? You must allow that there is nothing supernatural about this letter at any rate. No, sir. But it might very well have come from someone who believes that the supernatural is the root of all this business. What business? It strikes me that you three know a great deal more than I do about my own affairs. Watson, would you hand me yesterday's Times, please, the page with the leading article? You shall share our knowledge before you leave this room, Sir Henry. I promise you that. Here we are. 
If you imagine that your own industry will be protected by a tariff, you are misled. It stands to reason that such legislation will keep away wealth from the country or diminish the value of your imports and life in this land. What do you make of that? It probably makes good sense, but aren't we getting off the trail of the note a little? Watson, do you understand my method? Well, I confess I see no connection. And yet, my dear Watson, there is a very close connection. Hand me the note. If you value your life or your reason, keep away from the... And the other word is handwritten. Whoever composed this letter couldn't find the word more in the newspaper. You know, you're right. Really, Mr. Holmes. This exceeds anything I could have imagined. How do you do it? To me, the type style of a Times leading article is entirely distinctive. As the letter was posted yesterday, there was a strong probability that the words were cut from yesterday's paper. What else do you deduce, Holmes? Notice the word moor is written in rough characters. A reader of the Times must be expected to be well educated, therefore he wished to disguise his writing for fear that at some time his own hand may become known to you, Sir Henry. That is amazing. Do you see anything else? Nothing that is not verging on guesswork, except that I believe the sender of that letter is not ill disposed towards you since he warns you of impending danger. Or it may be that for his own purposes he wishes to scare me away. Quite possibly. Do you know the story of the Baskerville curse? Oh, of course. Though I never thought of taking it seriously until my uncle's death. Quite so. Holmes, supposing we adjourn to give us time to think over all that's happened. And meet again at Sir Henry's Hotel for lunch. In an hour, say. Is that convenient, Watson? Perfectly. Good morning and au revoir. Watson, get your hat and coat. We're going after them. My dear Watson, Baskerville has evidently been closely shadowed since his arrival in London. Maybe this is a chance to find out by whom. That's our man, Watson. Move out, driver, quickly. What a pity we didn't get the number. Watson. You do not seriously imagine that I'd let the cab go without noting its number. Oh, did you also see the occupant? I did. And you? Could you swear to the man's face? I could swear only to the beard. Uh, and that could have been false. Like that of one who wished to conceal his face? Ah, oh, well, let's get to the Northumberland Hotel. It's a fair walk from Baker Street. Upstairs expecting you, sir. Thank you. But before we go up, I'd like you to send a porter round to Waterloo Station. Ask him to find the driver of cab number 2074 and have him come here. Very well, sir. Good afternoon to you both. I trust your journey here was pleasant. Uh, not entirely. Tell me, Doctor, have you among your acquaintances on Dartmoor a man with a full dark beard? No. Uh, let me see. Yes, yes, Barrymore, Sir Charles Butler. And where is he now? At Baskerville Hall. You had better be sure of that. I will send him a telegram on your behalf, Sir Henry. Is everything ready for me? Signed, Sir Henry Baskerville. Now, if we send a second wire to the postmaster asking that this first be delivered into the hands of Barrymore and no other, and that it should be returned if that's not possible, we should know by this evening whether or not Barrymore is at his post. As soon as you've finished, we'll eat and I'll tell you of my plans. Seems to me someone's playing me for a sucker. Well, they'll find out they've started to monkey with the wrong man. I'm going down to Devon in the morning. I'm in full agreement, Sir Henry, except that you must not go alone. Dr. Mortimer will return with me. But the doctor has a practice to attend to. There must be someone with you every moment of the day and night. I could go. Well, now, that's real kind of you, Dr. Watson. I'd plan to take the 10.30 a.m. train from Paddington. Would that suit you? Perfectly. Then that's settled. Oh, 
Who was it inquired after me? And what's his complaint? It was I, and there's no complaint. Who was the gentleman in your cab in Baker Street this morning? I don't know, sir. He told me to ask no questions, so I didn't. All he said was that he was a famous detective, and his name was Summit Funny. Sherlock Holmes, I think. But he's on to us, Watson. It seems we've met a foe man worthy of our steel. I hope all goes well with you in Devon. I shan't rest until you're back at Baker Street. your mind by suggesting theories, Watson. I wish you simply to report all the facts to me by mail. The postal service is excellent. As you do that, I shall make inquiries in London. What kind of inquiries? I shall investigate the people connected with Sir Henry. Do you suspect Barrymore? We shall know better about that when Sir Henry arrives. Which is right now. Good morning. I've had a reply to my wire to Barrymore, so he must be at Baskerville Hall. Well, that seems to prove that your butler isn't the man following you around London. Goodbye, dear friend. I shan't relax until you are back safe and sound in London. Have no fear for me. I shall write my reports to you every day. Not a single detail will I miss. Goodbye. <laughs> something about the people we shall meet, Doctor. Well, first, there's Barrymore and his wife, a strange couple. The Barrymore family has been at the hall for the past four generations. They're both loyal and dependable. Your nearest neighbors will be the Stapletons, Jack and Beryl, brother and sister. He's a retired schoolmaster, had some trouble with an outbreak of fever at a school in the north. Three boys died, I believe. He gave it up and came to Devon to indulge his passion for insects. Spends his days chasing up and down the moors after this, that, or the other rare specimen of moth. His sister seems happy enough to pick wildflowers and be the lady of Mary Pitt House. There are no other neighbors? Not close to Baskerville Hall. Well, it certainly won't take long to make the acquaintance of these few folk. Oh, there is one other. Oh, who's that? You wouldn't have heard of the Notting Hill murderer, Sir Henry, but I'm sure that Dr. Watson has. You mean Selden, the maniac who escaped from Princetown Jail? I certainly do. He's believed to be hiding out on the moors near here. I pray that none of us should ever meet him face to face. He's a vicious killer, to be sure. Welcome to your ancestral home. You must be Barrymore. 
I'm sure pleased to meet you. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. He'll be staying a few days. Would you mind taking my bag inside for me, Barrymore? After sitting in that train for so long, I'd like to stretch my legs. I won't be long. has been described as an entomologist, and you're obviously hunting insects. Very good. I see now why Dr. Mossimer engaged you and Sherlock Holmes to investigate this case. One moment, sir. Holmes and I are not working on any case. In fact, Holmes is in London while I holiday in Devon. Answer me a question. How do you know who I am? Who? Oh, um, I just ran into Dr. Mossimer and he told me you were here. I suppose like some sort of dog, but none that I could identify. I've never in my life heard a more gruesome noise. What do you think it is? It may be a bit of... There are some nesting in the marshes. That was no bird. Then perhaps it was one of the moor ponies. Do you see those dark green patches over there? That's the great Grimpen Mire. It's supposed to be a bottomless bog. A pony may have strayed into it. Shouldn't we try to save it? No hope, I'm afraid. One small step and you're done for. I believe I'm the only man in England who's ever crossed to the heart of Grimpen Mire, and I know only one very tricky path to it. That's not a pony either. Have you heard what the local peasants say of that noise? What? That it's a hound calling for its prey. In fact, they say it's the hound of the Baskervilles calling for the blood of the Lord of Baskerville Hall. And, and what do you say? Only that this is the first time I've heard it since Sir Charles died. Oh! Do you see that psychopathy? Excuse me an instant. Go back. Go straight back to London. Can you not tell when a warning is for your own good? Get away from this place at all costs. But I've only just come. Who are you? Beryl! Oh, please, my brother. Don't tell him what I said. You have introduced yourselves, I see. I was just telling Sir Henry that it's the wrong time of the year to see the true beauty of the moors. And who do you imagine this is? Why, Sir Henry Baskerville. Afraid not, my dear. Just a humble commoner. Uh, Dr. Watson is my name. Then we've been talking at cross purposes. You've not had much time to talk. I, I mean, I talked as if you were a resident rather than a visitor. I'm sure nothing important was said. Would you care to come to Merripit House for tea, Dr. Watson? Uh, some other time, thank you. Uh, I have an errand in the village and it's getting rather late. Well, goodbye. I'm pleased to have met you. Goodbye, Doctor. Please forget my silly mistake. Of course, my dear. A telegram arrived yesterday with instructions to hand it to no one but Mr. Barrymore at Baskerville Hall. Yes, I took it there myself. Uh, and gave it to Barrymore? Well, not Mr. Barrymore. I gave it to his wife. Did you see the man? No, sir. Mrs. Barrymore took it inside and came back with Mr. Barrymore's reply. The instructions were to hand it to no one except the man to whom it was addressed. How do you know he was there? His wife told me he was. And I couldn't see no reason to think otherwise. Well, I can. Watson. May I ask you to question Barrymore about the telegram you sent, Sir Henry? Certainly. Do you think there's something suspicious? You'll see for yourself. Sir Henry, 
Did you receive my telegram yourself yesterday? I was up in the box room. Uh, my wife brought it to me. And uh, did you give the postman your reply? Not directly, sir. I told my wife what to say. I was busy preparing for your arrival. Have I done something wrong? Have I done anything to forfeit your confidence? No, no, Barrymore. Don't upset yourself. I didn't mean anything. In fact, I called you to tell you when the rest of my luggage arrives, you can have the pick of my clothes. The suit does not go with my new position. <laughs> Thank you, my lord. I'm sure I shall find a use for it. Very prickly character. Perhaps he has reason to cut the question short. I think I shall retire now. I have to write to Holmes to report this day. So there you have all the events of this first day in Devon. if I know whether my ears are playing tricks on me, Watson. But I could have sworn I heard a woman crying after I went to bed last night. I thought I heard the same thing. I also thought I heard footsteps on the landing outside my bedroom door. Well, did you see anything? No, but the footsteps sounded like a man. Uh, please forgive me. I'm not normally clumsy. I'll clean it up. Call your wife to do that, then pour the coffee, Barrymore. Seems a little under the weather, Barrymore. It may be a touch of influenza, my lord. Oh, dear. When did that come on? I didn't say that it came on, only that it may be influenza. You didn't by any chance get up in the night to look for medication for her, did you? There was no reason for that, Doctor. Mrs. Barrymore was perfectly well last evening. However, I shall take her to her room now. I could swear she's been crying. You could be right, but I don't think we should interfere in what may be a domestic problem. I think I'll just take a little walk. Could you wait while I get my overcoat? There's no need for that. I'd prefer to walk alone. I'm afraid I must insist on coming, Sir Henry. Holmes said I should never leave your side, especially when you go onto the moors. Come, come now. On a bright, clear day like this, what harm could possibly come to me? Really, Watson. I would much prefer to go alone. Thank you. 
a chance to talk to you, Sir Henry. I'm Beryl Stapleton, your neighbor. My brother and I were good friends of Sir Charles. I'm very pleased to meet the young lady Dr. Watson has told me about. I must apologize for my stupidity in thinking he was you, but I do not apologize for what I said. You must leave the moor. It is dangerous for you to stay here. But what is the danger? You know the legend of the Hound? I do not believe in such nonsense. But I do. You must go away from this place. It has always been fatal to your family. Not one of your ancestors has led a happy life in Devon. Why do you want to stay? To a man like me, it is the danger that makes the moor so attractive. I'm sorry, but that is in my nature. If you could maybe say something more definite. I can say no more than I have. I know nothing definite. Say, is, uh, is that your brother, the insect chaser? I just said, he'd be very angry. He feels it necessary that a Baskerville should be in residence at the hall to preserve the local customs. What do you think you're doing? Why are you out here? Had you arranged to meet this man? Now look here, this meeting was pure chance, and there is nothing in it that could warrant the way you speak to this lady. Kindly note that this lady is my sister, and I shall speak to her in any way I choose. It matters not a fig to me that you are Sir Henry Baskerville. I will not allow her to traipse around the moors unaccompanied. There is an escaped convict loose in this area, and I won't take any chances with her safety. She's perfectly safe with me here. But you won't be here very long, and I don't want her meeting you again in any case. Let's go back to the house. Are you all right, Sir Henry? Where did you come from? I'm sorry to have to admit that I was following you. Uh, for your own good, of course. I couldn't hear what was said, but Stapleton seemed to be very angry about something. He seems to have been angry that I was talking to his sister. But I can't for the life of me think why. I wonder if he might be crazy. I feel so sorry that my first meeting with such an attractive young woman should have gone so badly. I really was quite taken with Beryl Stapleton. just in case if you wish good evening gentlemen forgive the late hour i have been thinking about my behavior this afternoon and i realize now how awfully rude i was well it's big of you to apologize i must say if you weren't the young lady's brother my reaction might have been different i know that i must have appeared unreasonably angry but you see my sister and i are terribly close and to see her talking to a strange man on these dangerous moors made me quite lose my head can you forgive me I might find it easier to do so if I were permitted to get to know the two of you a little better. An excellent proposal. Perhaps I might be permitted to ask you to dine with us. Would Friday evening be acceptable? I don't think my social calendar is quite full just yet. I'd be delighted. Very well, Sir Henry. I shall look forward to Friday. Goodbye for now. I don't say now that he's not a crazy man. Even after such a handsome apology. I can't forget the look in his eyes this morning. But at least you have the opportunity to renew your acquaintance with his sister. <laughs> I sure do. But I think now is a good time to set about a little spook hunting. Eh, hey, Watson? I think you're right. It was about this time last night we heard those noises. Let's wait in your bedroom and see if they start again.
towards the west wing. As soon as they stop, we'll go after them. Securing the windows. At this time of night and in this wing? I'll be dashed if he was securing anything. It wouldn't surprise me if he was sending a signal. Oh, no, I, I assure you. Let's try this. out on the moor. The light is to show him we've left food there for him. Then your brother is... The escaped convict. Selden. Is that true? Now that my wife has told you, it's no longer my secret. Yes. Selden is her brother. Well, I can't blame you for standing by your wife. Go to your quarters. We'll discuss this in the morning. nerve he has. He is desperate. I wonder how far that is. Not more than a mile, I'd say. By thunder, Watson, I'm going after him. I'll come with you. noise they have on the moor. I've heard it before. Oh, that's the cry of a hound. What do the local people think of it? Oh, they're ignorant. What does it matter? I'm not a child, Watson. What do they say? They say it's the hound of the Baskervilles. I thought as much. Don't think me a coward, but that noise has frozen my very blood. Then let's turn back. Not on your life. We came out after a convict. We shall get him. Let's hope that hellhound doesn't get us first. We'll go up the hill and come down behind that rock. What do we do now? He won't be far from the light. Let's get closer.
we've lost him. I guess so. But at least he'll think twice before he comes near Baskerville Hall again. What's that over there? I can't see clearly enough. That was a man. A prison warder, probably, looking for Selden. Uh, let's go. We can tell them what we know tomorrow. Quite a night, you know, Barrymore. I realize that, my lord. But I must speak to you. Oh, come inside. I beg you, sir. Don't try to catch Selden. It's our duty. In a day or two, he's leaving for Southampton to get a ship for South America. He'll do no more harm to us. Please, don't interfere with this. The man is known to be a vicious killer. We can't let him escape. They'll hang him this time, sir. It would break my wife's heart. I'm sorry, Barrymore. I can't do less than I feel is right. However, he has had a fright now, and he may be a hundred miles away by tomorrow. I won't tell the police. You're very kind, sir. I should like to repay your kindness. I know something about Sir Charles's death. You know how he died? No, but uh, I do know he went out to meet someone that night. Who? That I cannot say, sir, but... It was a woman. I found this a few weeks ago. What does it say? Please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter and be at the gate by 10 o'clock. And it's signed by L.L. Why haven't you mentioned this before? I found it only after the inquest. I wouldn't say anything to harm Sir Charles's reputation. That letter is from a lady. What makes you so sure of that? Look at the handwriting. I think you're right. Dr. Mortimer knows everyone in the district. I'll ask him about a lady with the initials LL in the morning. Well, it may be a bit of a long shot, but there is a woman in Coombe Tracy called Laura Lyons. Whether she knew Sir Charles, I cannot say. There's no one else I can think of whose initials are LL. I'll try Miss Lyons anyway. Not Miss Lyons. She's married. Or was, anyhow. Oh, dear. So, I'd better go to see Mrs. Lyons and hear what she has to say. Hey, Jay there. You. You there. Are you speaking to me? You're a detective, aren't you? Well... Uh... You're looking for the killer. What do you know about it? Come up here. I have something to show you. Have you ever wondered how he survived out there on the moor? Uh, yes. I know how he gets his food. I see him every day. The killer? No. The lad who carries his victuals to him. I see him on that far path leading to the old stone ruins about this time every day. Got this, you see? If you'd like to take a peek, you'll see him any minute. I must go. I say, you won't forget to tell him it was me who told you, will you? out on this mysterious moor. 
I think I'll take a look in there. surrender. I'm coming in. Keep your hands above your head. Oh, dear. Lovely day, my dear Watson. Oh, home. Uh, how did you know I was in the hut? I know of only one man who smokes Bradley's Oxford cigarettes and he gets nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you saw me the night you were chasing the convicts. Oh, so that was you watching us. I had to come here. My investigations show that Sir Henry is in very real danger. Come, Watson. Great heavens, if we're too late. Henry, this is my fault. I should never have left him alone. I hadn't expected that he would meet his demise quite so soon. It's just as much my fault as yours. We'll need help to carry the body back to the hall. Oh, no, we won't. He's not going back there. Why not? Take a look for yourself. Oh, oh, merciful heaven. It's not Sir Henry. It's Selden, the convict. Wearing one of his lordship's suits. One of the suits Sir Henry gave to Barrymore. He must have passed it on to this poor wretch. Why, Dr. Watson, that's not you, is it? Oh, dear me, is someone hurt? Is that our friend Sir Henry? It's not. It's Selden. Selden? I thought, is he dead? He seems to have fallen and broken his neck. Is that what you think, Mr. Holmes? You're very quick at identification, my friend. We've been expecting you ever since Dr. Watson arrived. And now we have an unpleasant remembrance to take back to London with us. You're leaving? There are more important things to worry us than ghostly hounds. So you heard it? I heard nothing. Let's go. We can send someone to pick up the body. Good night, gentlemen, and goodbye. Are we really giving up? Not at all. We're not moving an inch. In fact, I shall wire Inspector Lestrade to come to Devon with an arrest warrant. On the way there, I'll tell you about a woman called Laura Lyons. investigating the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. I understand you have some knowledge of the circumstances. Why do you think that? Because of the letter you sent asking him to meet you that night. I asked him to burn it. Are there no gentlemen left? I wanted to borrow a little money, that's all. I must warn you, we are treating his death as murder. 
I didn't keep the appointment. Because Jack Stapleton told you not to. How do you know that? I didn't until now. However, I would have found out. It's not difficult to check up on an ex-school teacher and his wife. Wife? He's not married. Madam, the woman he calls his sister is, in fact, his wife. That's not true. He and I are to be married just as soon as I get my divorce. That's why I wanted to borrow the money. But Stapleton told you not to keep your appointment. Uh, and the next thing we know, Sir Charles is dead. I know nothing about it. <laughs> I believe you. You're not the only one who's been taken in by that man. I'm sorry, my dear. Not for long, I'm afraid. I must return to London and take Watson with me. But your job's not finished. We still don't know what killed my uncle. I think we do. Then tell me, man. I shall be able to do that very soon. Uh, Mr. Stapleton to see you, Sir Henry. Would you bring in some tea, Barrymore? I was just passing, and I thought I'd pop in to remind you about dinner tonight. Oh, sure. I hadn't forgotten. Sit down. Have some tea. I'm sorry. I can't stay. I have a few more specimens to mug this afternoon. Well, that's a shame. We too must leave, Sir Henry. I'll walk to the gate with you. Well, that's funny. I left my walking boots here this morning, and now one of them's gone. There's no need to come up. Here's the carriage now. Goodbye, Sir Henry. I shall return with a solution to this mystery. I shan't move until you get back. Don't forget your dinner engagement with the Staplesons. You can't disappoint them. Do you think I'll be safe to go out alone tonight? No harm will come to you, I promise. Goodbye, Sir Henry. Goodbye. Watson, the incredible similarity between Jack Stapleton and the portrait of Sir Hugo. So that's it. I've been wondering why you suspect him. Do you think he's a Baskerville? Excellent deduction. But you just told Sir Henry to go to dinner with him this evening. He's a killer. Oh, no. He's not a killer. And Sir Henry's quite safe with us watching over him. Let help Inspector Lestrade is on that train. something big, Holmes, to drag me all this way. We have the warrant? Yes. Then tonight, you shall have your something big. Holmes, do you think you could tell us how you arrived at your conclusions? Of course. We shall take tea, and then a slow drive to Mary Pitt House, during which time I'll explain everything. What I'd like to know first... No, Watson. I'll put things in order. When we first realized that Sir Henry was being followed around London, I knew it had to be someone who knew Dr. Mortimer. He must have mentioned his errand, probably in passing, to someone living near Baskerville Hall. The next thing was a man in the carriage. He's obviously too clever to think of a black beard as only a disguise. How much better if he could throw suspicion onto one of Sir Charles' close acquaintances. Therefore, he must have known Barrymore. You never thought it was Barrymore? Not after I received your letter about Stapleton being a schoolteacher whose students had died of fever. 
a kind of person is easily traced. My suspicions started when you wrote about brother and sister, and my inquiries showed him to be a married man with no other relatives. Why was he lying except to hide his background? What was he trying to hide? Could it be that he stood to gain something from Sir Charles' death? The British Museum suggested the answer to this. There was a Baskerville who had fled England in disgrace, taking with him a son. There was a strong possibility this might now be the man who called himself Stapleton. The portrait proved that finally. And you knew all this before you arrived here? I knew very little, but suspected a lot. My few days hiding out on the moor strengthened my suspicions. That's why I told no one I was here. What about the warning note for Henry got? I have already allowed that he was a clever man. I don't know yet what purpose that served. I couldn't arrest someone for being related to a dead man. If Stapleton killed Sir Charles, I must have proof. That is precisely why I sent Sir Henry into Stapleton's hands this evening, to get proof. What do you think he'll do? I don't know, but we shall position ourselves outside his house and wait for his move. Did you bring a weapon? I have my revolver. Good. Driver, pull up here. We can walk the rest of the way. I'll go down to peek through the windows. You go up there and wait. Be careful. I confess to having no theories as to how they plan to do this. We'll just have to sit and wait. It's been two hours and still nothing's happened. Oh, no. Look over there. Uh, if that comes down, we have no chance of seeing even one another, let alone that house. It's moving pretty quickly. There's not much time left. I think Sir Henry's leaving. He'd walk straight into the fog. Well, thank you very much, Jack. The pleasure was all mine. Now, do be careful walking home. Stick to the road at all costs. That fog is very thick. I shall be careful. We'd better get closer to him. from this. Quickly, we must save Sir Henry. You can kill it. Shoot again. He's fainted. More wonder. Watson. Watson, you stay with 
Mr. Henry. We'll go for Stapleton. Don't try to move. Anyone. He found out that I'd sent a note to Sir Henry in London. You sent that note? I suspected Jack was behind Sir Charles' death. I wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. And then tonight I saw him lead that hideous animal into the outhouse and realize what he was going to do. I argued with him. I pleaded with him not to do it. You know where he is now? He would have gone into the mire where no one can follow. Do you think you could lead us to him? I'll try. But it's very dangerous. <laughs> No one could pick his way through the mire in this fog. That must be Jack. He's gone under. God rest his soul. The poor sad fool. put broken twigs into each solid patch. He was the only one who knew the way through. Aha, Sir Henry's boot. He needed to steal that to give the hound its scent. Will you be very upset if they can't find him? When I saw that frog last night, I knew he'd never be able to cross the mire. I'm quite resigned to the idea that he's gone forever. And I'm not sorry. He was an evil man. I have decided to take a long cruise to help forget this dreadful incident. Perhaps when I get back, you too might have forgotten. I shall be here. <laughs> This is where he kept the beast, obviously. Why did Stapleton choose this way to commit his murders? If he wanted to inherit the Baskerville title, he needed to be absolutely free of any suspicions. What better way to do that than to resurrect the ancient curse on the family? Well, it seems that this time, he turned out to be the one who suffered. I think you're right. Well, Watson, that solves the mystery of the Hound of the Baskervilles, and, as always, the solution was elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. <laughs> <laughs>